romper, stomper, bomper, boo. Tell me, tell me, tell me, do. Magic mirror, tell me today, did all my friends have fun at play? I see Graham and Denise, and I see Rob and Gina. I see Carol and Carol. I see Phyllis and Chris and Erica, and I see you too. Did you have fun today? Not having as much fun as usual these days with the stay at home order, but we can still learn together. We can still share some music together and share the word of God together. Let's begin by praying. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. In spite of everything, we still say thank you. We thank you for spring, for rain, for new growth. We thank you for new family members and the chance to say goodbye to the ones we've lost. Please be with us wherever we are right now and wherever we find ourselves in the coming week. Give us wisdom and grace and peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We've talked before about the fact that in scripture, people's names often meant more than just the sound that you made if you wanted to get their attention. It wasn't just what they wrote on the my name is sticker on their shirt or what it said on their driver's license so you'd know whose it was. Very often for the people who experienced those lives and recorded them in scripture, a person's name rose out of something that was true about who they were, about something that had happened to them, or about the circumstances surrounding their birth, which sometimes was good and sometimes was bad, but it was very revealing about who they were and what their life was. And the same is true of God. When we say the word God, well, that could mean any number of things to any number of groups of people. But in, a, um, in Scripture, God introduces himself first by just saying, I am. That's the first name he gives himself to anyone. And throughout scripture, people start adding descriptors. After that, I am. So rather than just calling him Yahweh, they would call him Yahweh something else, as he revealed more of who he was through his actions and through what he had to say to humanity. For example, this morning we're looking at the name that is in English often pronounced Jehovah Jireh. Now that is an extremely anglicized version of a Hebrew name that would have pronounced something more like Yahweh Yireh. And that name arises first in a story that describes an event in the life of Abraham when Abraham was up against something that he just didn't know how to get past. It was probably the worst thing that ever happened to him in his life. And God had demanded something of him that Abraham did not want to have to give up. But Abraham was willing to at least try and trust God. And in the end, God provided a way out, provided a substitute. And in that event, we first see the words, Yahweh, Yireh, God provides. So when we say, Jehovah Jireh. We're saying that God provides. He can prov he provides because he's faithful. He never lets us down. He provides because he never changes. He is always the same. That's hard to understand. And sometimes we think that's a bad thing. Sometimes we think it's not good that God never changes because if he never changes, well, I mean, he's from way back then. If he doesn't change, how can he understand, like, how a cell phone works? Would God know how to use a cell phone? Well, how is that possible? He's from the oldie times. How can he know how to use a cell phone? When, in fact, the opposite is true. The fact of the matter is that God, in oldie times, already knew how to use a cell phone. He already understood how a cell phone works. He already understands technologies that we haven't even imagined yet. 
He understands things about the universe, about science, about the human mind and heart that we have yet to discover. God never changes. And in his unchangingness, he is faithful and he provides. We thank God that we can call him Yahweh Yireh. We thank him that when he calls us to follow, he will make it possible for us to follow. Like Abraham, when we have to make great sacrifices, I am will provide the resources. When, like the prophet Elijah, we are running for our lives or hiding in a cave, I am will provide the strength to do what we need to do. When, like Jesus, we find ourselves trying to carry something that is too heavy for us to deal with on our own, I am provides help from other people around us. When, like the Apostle Paul, we are going in the wrong direction, I am provides correction and a map. When, like the Apostle Peter, we are called to move forward in ways that we do not understand, I am provides the vision that we need from his perspective and his understanding. And when our brothers and sisters all throughout time and around the world, today and in the past, when they have to stand up to their persecutors, I am provides courage, eloquence, and ultimate hope because I am provides and I am is Moses there and proclaimed his name, I am. I am the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, and rich in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin. to the clouds. You preserve human and beast, and they take refuge in the shadow of your wings. For with you is life's fountain, and in your light we see Not 
allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear, but when temptation comes, you will also provide a way of escape. death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height and depth, or any created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. John 20, 19 to 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks on his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Hello there. We're back in my office. <laughs> Ontario is back in stay-at-home order. And the way my week is going, I'm not going to be able to talk to you out in the sanctuary. So um, the sound may not be as good, but we're going to give this a try. Please excuse the hat. I'm here in my office. And I have terrible COVID hair. So to prevent to protect you guys, this is what we're doing. My homage to the expos. Today we're going to talk about doubt. And it's something that we talked about at our book study that we're doing at First Baptist Church. We're studying The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. And uh, the chapter that we looked at earlier this week was, I still have doubt, so I can't be a Christian. We're going to look at a couple of scripture passages that touch on the idea of doubt and how Jesus responded to people who doubted. 
and look at some some ideas that came from Strobel's chapter as well. Sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, if we think about the doubts that we have, whether we are Christians and we still have doubts, or maybe we're not believers yet, and you, and you say, you know what, I can't believe because I have all these doubts, and I just can't believe it. There's a few things I want to suggest, and Lee Strobel suggests in his book as well. The first thing is to take a look at the things that could be underlying the doubt. Sometimes doubt can be, the expression of doubt can be a smoke stream. Sometimes it's put up totally unconsciously. Sometimes we do it intentionally. But sometimes doubt is a cover for different other things that are, that's really going on in our lives. It could be a cover for rebellion. And that's hard to admit and hard to hear sometimes. But sometimes we say we doubt, but it's really because we don't want to believe. We want to do our own thing. We don't want to do things the way God wants us to do them. And so we put up a screen of doubts to hide the fact that, um, that we're rebelling against God. We're wanting to do our own thing. Sometimes disappointment with God, you know, just I, I have my doubts about God, but it really is at the root of those doubts is a deep, deep disappointment, something that you would hope for God to do in your life and it just didn't happen. Or Strobel also suggests personal and family wounds. And I find sometimes, this is a generalization, this isn't everybody, but some people who <coughs> will claim to be atheists, at the root of their atheism, at the root of their severe doubts, the deep disappointment in God, and deep personal and family wounds, which may create an anger towards God. There's some people who I've heard say that they, they know they're not an atheist because God must exist because they're so angry at him. And so sometimes, rather than dealing with the smoke screen of doubt, we have to deal with disappointment in the wounds and the hurts. Sometimes there are intellectual doubts. And those can be legit, and you have to kind of work through those. God didn't tell us to park our brains at the door. But there are times, I think, when we hold Christianity and religion and faith to a higher standard of truth than we hold some other things. We are willing to take the COVID vaccine or any vaccine, the flu vaccine, based upon the word of the doctors and the health experts. We don't have to fully understand how it works or fully grasp it. We have faith. We don't, I don't fully grasp how electricity works, but I know if I flip that light switch on over there, the light will go on. Yet sometimes when it comes to Christianity, we feel like it has to be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. And it's hard to prove something infinite to the satisfaction of our finite minds. And so the challenge sometimes with our intellectual doubts is to come to a place where there's an acceptable level of inability to answer things. And for some people, that's just really hard to accept. We'll touch on that a little bit later towards the end. But the thing about faith and the scriptures and Christianity is it is so complex that there are books, <laughs> entire libraries written about Christ and the scriptures. And yet it's something so simple. Where Jesus said, if you have the faith of a little child, you inherit the kingdom of God. Sometimes the seasons of our lives can be at the root of doubt. And it's not so much that we thought about stuff and we've fallen into doubt, but we've gotten so busy in our lives. Our season of life has just become so busy that our faith suffers from benign neglect. And doubt creeps in because we haven't given ourselves enough time to seriously sit down and think about God and our life and our relationship with him and our faith. Strobel writes that doubt can really creep in when we lack contemplative time. We lack time to really sit in God's presence and 
think about him and his life and our lives and the scriptures and what he's called us to do. Sometimes doubt creeps in because we compare ourselves to others. And Strobel makes a really good point where he says, the, the book of Psalms, the poetry book of the Bible, 150 different psalms and poems, and 60% of them are what are called psalms of lament. Basically psalms of complaining, psalms of whining, <laughs> psalms where people say, why do the wicked prosper? And here I am following God and nothing good is happening to me. And sometimes when we make that comparison, we feel that where is God and, and the doubt begins to creep in. And rather than just saying, you know, I doubt, I just, I'm a doubter and just leaving in the death. The challenge is to think about what some of the underlying issues are behind the doubt. Is it rebellion? Is it disappointment with God? Is it wounds that happen in my life? Are there intellectual doubts that maybe I'm holding Christianity to too high a standard, higher, a higher standard than I would in any other scientific world? I, am I just too busy? Or am I just comparing myself with others and feeling that I'm getting the short end of this book? When we have those doubts, we can think, well, God wouldn't want me around if I doubt, if I doubt him. And, you know, I doubt that he, I doubt that he'd be very happy about that. But in the passage we've heard read from the Gospel of John, which happened just after Jesus' crucifixion, which we celebrated last week, we hear about Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, who wouldn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead until he saw him with his own eyes. But even beyond that, till he put his hands into the nail prints in the wrist. And the, and, and the, the, the wound in his side was a spear went in. So Thomas could have sensibly proof that there was Jesus was from the dead, he wouldn't be. And so the passage tells us that as Jesus appeared before his disciples, um, and that Thomas was there, and Jesus says, He speak to you. And then he turns right to Thomas. And he didn't say, Thomas, I told you I was going to rise from the dead. I told you if they destroyed the temple in three days, I would build it back together. Weren't you listening? How dare you doubt me? No. He said, Thomas, come here. Here, feel this. Here, look at this. Feel this. Jesus displayed grace for his promise. He was not angry, I was finger wagging at him. And he gave Thomas what he needed. I think sometimes we sell guys short a little bit and don't realize that he wants to meet us where we are. I mean, ultimately, to, to have a relationship with God, we have to go to where he is, to the foot of the cross. And accept his forgiveness. And as he draws us to that place, he goes to where we are. He gives us what we need. And for some people, it is an intellectual answer. For some people, it is a feeling of a deep seated wound. There's all different things that we need. But this passage from Thomas tells me that Jesus. Is willing to give it. But then he also taught Thomas a lesson. He said, this is good. I'm glad that you believe now that you have had your proof answered. But he said, blessed are those who have not seen it and yet believe. And so he's challenging Thomas and his disciples going forward about what faith really is. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it and fully understand it, and fully know what it's all about, then it's not faith, it's knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge that goes into the Christian faith. At some point, there's always the deep, the deep of faith, deep beyond our doubts and over our doubts. 
and into into things. And these two can go can live together. Now, there's another passage in scripture in Mark 9, where a man comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to come and heal his demon possessed son. And Jesus says, Well, if you believe all things are possible, and the man responds, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Paradox, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, I believe. But I don't believe. I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. These things coexisted in that same person and he expressed his belief in Christ. And he also expe expressed his human doubts. But he didn't live in that doubt. He didn't stay there. He took it to Jesus and said, help me. Help me with the, the parts of this faith story that I don't get yet. A lot of it I believe. And I believe enough that you can heal my son. And Jesus did. Lord, help me with these parts that I, that I, don't, that I don't get yet. Belief and unbelief kind of mixed together. Now, it wasn't just toxic debt. Toxic debt is when you live in that debt and it just, you become cynical and you become, because more than a smoke screen, it actually becomes a screen, a wall that you cannot get past. And I think we need to guard against that point where we cross that line. There is a tipping point where a healthy doubt crosses over into toxic things. You really need to guard against that. But God wants to help us through those kinds of things. To build faith inside. God will suggest a few ways to build up faith and deal with those. He said that faith is an act of the will. At some point, you just have to decide. At some point, you just have to choose. And so, at some point, you have to say, well, even though there are some lingering doubts on the periphery, I still understand enough that I believe enough and have enough faith that I can jump in and make that decision. God's not going to drag us kicking and screaming into faith. It's got to be an act of the will. Strobel suggests get around people who have faith. Listen to music, read books, be with people who have come to the point of moving beyond doubts to their faith. Even though they may hold on to some things that they're not sure about, their faith is strong. And they built it up over time. And that can be contagious and encouraging and affirming. And so as we spend time with people of faith, it encourages our own faith. Strobel also says, be careful not to put faith in faith. You hear some songs sometimes, even some Christian songs, that it's like, you know, just have faith. But faith in what? <laughs> you know? Faith in faith itself is kind of like circular. I heard it once said, that, you know, talking about people who are very sincere. And he said, well, you can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. You can have great faith, but you're you put the faith in something that's not worthy of your faith and that won't actually work, then what good is the faith? The Bible says if you have faith like a mustard seed, you move mountains. It's not about the amount of faith you have, it's about who you put your faith in. So there's a caution there. It's not about putting your faith in faith. It's about putting that faith I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, that, I believe that that's a place that we can live in. To have that faith in, in Christ. To still wonder about some stuff, but to take this, take it to God and ask for God's help to be able to deal with it. There's a story of two evangelists that Lee Strobel touches on. Um, Charles Templeton and Billy Graham. 
both worked for an organization that I used to work for, Youth for Christ. They were two of the top evangelists with Youth for Christ in the late 1940s and early 50s. Templeton from Canada, Graham from the southern U.S. And if you ask people back then who was going to be the next great evangelist to make a difference for Christ in the gospel throughout the world, people would have said, well, Graham's pretty good, but it's going to be the Templeton. There came a point when Templeton had dealt. And he took them to Billy Graham and said, I need to get these dealt with. That's a good thing. Templeton said, well, I'm going to get more education. I need some answers. I need some intellectual answers. And so he enrolled at Princeton, which an education is a good thing. But over time, he moved from intellectual to intellectualism. It became an ism. And Intellectualism kind of became God rather than God, and he ended up turning agnostic. The living in his doubts, wrestling and trying to deal with every one of them and getting every answer possible, um, destroyed his faith. And Billy Graham took another approach. And as the story told, we took a walk off, off the other golf course and just came to the conclusion that, God, I know you saved me. I know who you are. I don't understand everything. But I'm going to take it at face value and if the Bible says it, I believe it. And Templeton is suddenly you known in some ways thought that Graham, as much as he respected Billy, Billy Graham and did to his dying day, he thought that Graham was committing intellectual suicide. But I think Graham handled doubts properly. Where he didn't hold Christianity up to some unattainable standard. He had a relationship and experience with God that radically changed his life. And even though he couldn't understand it all, I think he recognized that his mind was finite. And his finite mind was never going to grasp all of the infinite. Billy Graham said later in his life that his one regret was that he didn't have more education, formal education. So education is not necessarily a bad thing. But it can be a dangerous thing if it's something that feeds toxic growth. Strobel concludes that the way of dealing with doubt and about coming to faith is that he talked about the preponderance of evidence in God's faith. That as you look into what you're doubting, if you examine, peel away the light, peel away the layers, and really examine faith, and you see that there's a preponderance of evidence pointing in God's favor, even though there are a few things on the periphery you don't get, there's enough there to be able to make that rational choice of faith and to believe in God. And that's enough. And you can hold those peripheral things at bay while you take the time to try and come to answers and try to deal with them and, and don't take the God, take them to God and say, look, I, I believe that helps my unbelief with this thing over here. It's not serious enough to wreck our relationship, but I, but I'd like to know the answer to it. And I think sometimes we just have to be comfortable with the fact that some things our finite minds won't grasp. And some things we won't know until heaven. So if you're wrestling with doubts and you're a Christian, then you're in good company with Thomas and with this other fellow. I believe, help my unbelief. Take those out to Christ and ask him to journey with you. But be sure to, to understand that these are the peripheral things. Be careful that the doubt doesn't drop to that tipping point with the toxic doubt. And if you're not a believer yet, and you've been working through doubts, a couple of suggestions. Really honestly ask yourself, are these doubts spokespeople? 
if there's something deeper that is keeping me away from faith in God, and maybe those are the things that you need to talk to somebody about, talk to God about, and deal with. Then know that when we come to God with our doubts, like the way he treated Thomas, he's not going to get angry at you. He's going to show grace. He's going to show love. He's going to gently direct you towards the answers that you need. And you may not get, you may not get all the answers you need. But ask yourself, am I holding this to a higher standard than anything else I hold in my life? And does the preponderance of evidence, the evidence I see in creation around me, the evidence I see in changed lives around me, the evidence I feel and sense in my conscience that the Holy Spirit speaks to me, the evidence of scriptures and how reliable they are. Even if I can't answer all the questions on the periphery, does the preponderance of evidence point to a rational decision of faith in God? If it does, take the leap, leap of faith. And I promise you, you won't regret it. You begin to live the life that God created you to live. Father, help us in our times of death to turn them over to you. Help us, Lord, to get around people and faith and, and, and books and music and different things that can encourage our faith in those times when we go. Help us, Lord, to distinguish between the peripheral issues and the core issues. Help us, Lord, to, to peel back the layers of doubt and really understand maybe why we are feeling this way. And Lord, just thank you for the gift of faith that you give us. And that is the faith of the mustard seed in life. Lord, may we be always be able to say when we do face it, that I believe, Lord, help me to overcome my own burden. In Jesus' name, amen.